good morning and welcome to part three of our series, The Disappearing Church, where the church is headed and God's plan to turn it all around. Welcome to my home. I'm obviously not preaching live in person, but from my living room over the course of our time, hopefully that'll make sense why. Now, this teaching, this entire series is built on the data and the troubling trends that were in a book that came out a few years ago by author John Dickerson. His book is called The Great Evangelical Recession, Six Factors That Will Crash the American Church and How to Prepare. Now, with a title like that, you're thinking, what did I get myself into? Why am I here? I want you to know Clear Creek is not a doom and gloom church. We are not predicting the end of the world or the end of the church next Thursday at 2 p.m. Rather, rather, we've simply seen some troubling trends that we want to be wise enough to acknowledge so that we're prepared to step into the future that God is prepared for us. And so we're looking at four of Dickerson's six trends over the course of these weeks together. Week number one, we looked at factor number one, which was that the evangelical church, that means people like you and me who believe the Bible is the word of God, it's authoritative in our lives, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father except through him, you know, basic things. He says that the evangelical church in the United States is not nearly as large as we've been told. You say, Josh, okay, okay. how big is the church? Is it 80% of the United States? No. 40%? No. According to research, the evangelical church, people who believe the core doctrine, there are only 7 to 8.9% of the entire United States population. We're much, much smaller than we ever thought. The second factor that we looked at last week was that unless generational patterns change radically, Many ministries will see revenue decrease by 50 to 70 percent in the next 10 to 30 years. That would be devastating for most American churches if they lost 50 to 70 percent of their annual revenue in the next 10 to 30 years. But today, today we're looking at, I think, the most troubling trend, but it's one that we have, I think, some of the greatest ability to impact and make a difference. So factor number three, the one we're looking at today is this, the evangelical church in the United States is losing the people it does have, and the 20-somethings are exiting faster than any other group. So factor number three is we are smaller than we thought, and we're losing people at an alarming rate, especially among the 20-somethings. Now, you say, why? What's going on? The reality is this is pretty common. I read a story about a young man that is typical of this generation. His name is Scott Miller. Scott Miller always recited Bible verses as a kid. He knew the Bible, he attended Christian school, and had evangelical parents who loved God and had been faithful in their 35 years of marriage. They took Scott to church every Sunday morning and even on Wednesday night. Scott, now 30 years old, doesn't believe in God anymore. In fact, last time he set foot in a church building was for a wedding two years ago. He doesn't believe the Bible is believable or reliable or relatable to his life. And chances are you know a Scott in your life because Scott is one of 260,000 evangelical young people who walk away from the Christian faith every year. He is one of roughly two in three evangelical 20-somethings who abandon their faith by age 30. 260,000 young people, that's a quarter of a million people, will leave the faith every year, and two out of three of them will never come back to the faith. In fact, this, Dickerson says, may be the most disturbing of all the trends we face, our failure to retain our own children as disciples. Simply keeping kids as disciples would help offset how fast the population is growing, but we're not even keeping our own kids. This is why I said this is maybe the most troubling of all the trends, because your kids mean so much to you. Your grandkids mean so much to you. Your nieces and nephews matter so much to you, and here's the point, they matter to God as well. And we cannot afford to watch them walk away from the faith without a fight, can we, church? And yet we're seeing so many of them leave and never come back. This is such a big deal that researchers such as Josh McDowell, Lifeway Research, the Barna Group, and even other secular researchers such as the UCLA have all landed at figures between 69 and 80% of all evangelical teens will leave the church after high school. Here's the way to think of that. 69 to 80%, that is up to four out of every five teenagers will walk away from the church 
and two out of every three of those will not come back. You say, but Josh, come on, come on, come on. Once they hit 30, once they have kids, once the real world just piles on top of them, they will come back to church, right? Yeah, some will, but research shows the majority will never return. This is a troubling trend and it's impacting the future of the church in the United States. In fact, Ed Stetzer, he's another researcher, he makes the point that most of the unchurched people that he meets in our culture are actually churched kids who are no longer going to church. Most unchurched people are former churched people. This is a very troubling trend. Now, I wanna give you one number to capture all this. I'm giving you a lot of stats, so if you don't remember any other number, remember this one. It is the number 712, 712. You say, what's that number, what's that number? 712 is the number of young people who walk away from the faith every day, 712. To give you perspective, before COVID, when we were able to gather in person as a church, all in one room together, we had a little bit more than 712 people in that room you're sitting in right now. That's the number of people that are walking away every day, one pre-COVID Clear Creek gathering experience every day. And tomorrow, 712, and the next day, 712. That's the number of young people who are walking away from the faith every day. Day. This is why Princeton professor Kenda Dean suggests that the loss of our youth is an indication of what's actually going on in the larger church among all generations. You say, okay, so what's going on? What, what's happening that's causing all this? Well, there's two final quotes I want to give to you. The first one's by a man named David Kinneman. He's a researcher. He says, quote, the dropout problem is at its core a faith development problem. To use religious language, it's a disciple-making problem. The church is not adequately preparing the next generation to follow Christ faithfully in a rapidly changing culture. We're doing a lot of good things, but we're not making disciples who are ready for the next step in the culture and facing what is to come. John Dickerson says, second quote, the body is bleeding out because its leaders, its servants, and its people have forgotten how to make disciples as Jesus described and modeled. What, are we, fail what we are failing at is real ministry, not commercial or mass marketed events, but real ministry in real lives, the way that Paul, Peter, John, and even Jesus did. To slow the bleeding, he says, we must first reach their parents with authentic relational discipleship. And to reach the parents, we must first reach their leaders, and in many cases, their pastors. Their pastors, their preachers, their elders. He says, for us to reach the young people means their parents, and to reach them means the preachers and the leaders in the church. In other words, he's saying part of the problem right now, the reason so many young people are leaving, comes down to church leadership. Why? Now, now when I read that, it was like the record going, Err! because what is causing that? What am I doing that is contributing to the problem? He goes on to explain that the core problem here is that the American church has gotten really good at building big buildings, having big programs, big events, filling up calendars, but we have not filled up hearts to be like Jesus Christ. In other words, we are so busy at building the American church, focusing on sermons and Sundays and Bible classes and other fine things, but we're not focusing on the most important thing, which is making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. This is why he says this, if we want to rebuild and restore a culture of discipleship, we have no choice but to release the way American church was done in the 20th century. The tyranny of the urgent has overtaken us. The late 20th century church model in many applications requires so much energy and attention that little to nothing is left for anything else, including discipleship. He says, the 20th century church model, which revolved around buildings, weekend gathering sermons, and special events, is not primarily focused on discipleship. Discipleship gets crowded out because doing all those things takes so much time. I was talking to a friend not too long ago, and he made the point, he's in ministry, and he said, Josh, I spend 90% of my time keeping the engine going of sermons, Sunday school, and service projects and only 10% of actually making disciples. And friends, the consequence is our children are not being discipled and they're walking away when they have a choice. And this is not okay. I know you know this is not okay. At the end of the day, if we do nothing else, we have to make 
disciples. You say, okay, Josh, I see the problem. What do we do about it? Well, we go back to the way Jesus made disciples. Well, how do you do that? How do you do it? So Jesus, he shows up on the scene. He's got to start this movement that's going to outlast him, that's going to reach the four corners of the world. How does he do it? Well, does he show up and say, okay, okay, fellas, here's what we need to do. We need a building. And I need you to get me like one of those really cool over-the-ear microphones, you know, like Garth Brooks wears. And of course, his disciples go, wait, 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 who's Garth Brooks? He goes, well, he's a country music singer, won't be born for 2,000 years. Don't, don't worry about it. Just give me a really cool microphone. And I need you to get me big screens so we can put the Bible verses up on the screen. We need some music and we need all this stuff. And is that what Jesus said? <laughs> no, he didn't do that. Now, Jesus did speak to the crowds. We know that. He spoke to thousands. But... He emphasized and spent his time drawing out 12, what do we call them? Disciples. 12 people that he poured his time, energy, and emphasis on, meaning small enough number that he was able to know them and for them to know him, for him to mentor and apprentice them and then give feedback and modeling and for him to send them out, let them come back, hear how they did well, coach them on where they did poorly. In other words, it took time and intentionality that you cannot get with large crowds, but only in smaller disciple-making communities. Jesus did not change the world through large crowds, but with smaller disciple-making communities. Yes, he preached to the crowds, but he focused on smaller disciple-making communities. You say, okay, wow, that's great, that's Jesus, but what about the church, Josh? Come on, the church is different. It's not like that. Well, it's not. In fact, the first Christians, how did they change the world so much that you and I now are talking about this Jesus 2,000 years away on the other side of the world? What did they do? Again, did they get together and build a big building and get all the technology and have children's programming and youth programming and Bible class? Those are all good, by the way. I'm not opposed. But is that what they did? No. They got together in smaller disciple-making communities. And, and what did they call these things? Someone goes, I know, I know. And you say, yes, yes. What do you? I bet they call them small groups, right? They got together and they called these smaller disciple-making communities small groups. Nope, that's not what they called them. I, I know, I know. Okay, over there, over there. They called them discipleship groups, right? Is that what they call them? No, no. They call them Bible classes. No, they called them D groups. Or No, no, no. What do they call them? Let me show you four passages. I want you to see what these smaller disciple-making communities were called. First one is in Romans chapter 16 and verse, uh, verse 5. It says, also, this is Paul speaking, also, Give my greetings to the church that meets in their homes. Now, did you, did you notice this? The disciple-making community is called a church. The group that meets in their home is called the church. Someone goes, hey, Josh, Josh, Josh. No, 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 that can't be it. Because the church is a big building, it's a place where people come on Sunday and it stays empty most of the rest of the week. That's the church, that's gotta be the church. You gotta have chairs, you gotta have programming and baptistries, that's the church, right? No, 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 I'm just telling you, what they called it was the church. In your home, the church. Second passage, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Paul again says, the churches here in the province of Asia also send greetings in the Lord. As do Aquila and Priscilla, these are a couple of people who love Jesus, and all the others who gather, notice this, in their home for church meetings. But Josh, you got to have a building for church, right? You got to go, you got to have Bible class, you got to have all these things for it to be the church. No, no, no. The church is where two or more are gathered in Jesus' name. The home is a place that can be the church. Two more passages, Colossians 4, 5. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that meets in her what? Her home. And finally, Philemon chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Athia, and to our fellow soldier Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. In other words, they met in these smaller disciple-making communities that met for the purpose of making disciples and planting churches. So why am I preaching to you from here today? because I wanted to introduce you and welcome you into my church. This is our church. And every morning, the members of our little church gather around our breakfast table. We read scripture together and we pray together. In fact, behind me, I don't know if you can see it, but we have a chain over here of scriptures that we're doing one every day during the season of Lent that we're in right now. And we gather and we're discipling our children imperfectly, mind you. But this is our church. Where you are, that's not the church because the building is not the church. 
It's where the people of God gather. That is the church. And your home is the first church your kids will ever know. Where you are, most of the time, is the church that they will know the most. And this is why, this is why, listen, it has to begin with us. That if we want to see a change in this disturbing and troubling trend, it has to begin with us recognizing that the church, the way the American church has been done with big buildings and programs and all that, has got to become a secondary focus, not the primary focus. In fact, in fact, Jesus did it this way, the early church did it this way, but third, these massive movements of God where thousands and millions are coming to faith in other parts of the world, they are gathering this way as well. In fact, they don't gather in big buildings like you and I do. In fact, if we said that's how you got to do it, they'd say, well, we can't reach people quickly or well if we have to do it that way because it's expensive, it's complex. And so what they're doing is they're meeting in smaller communities, these churches, and they're making disciples rapidly. Let me give you three stories. First one, I love this. The first story is in Southeast Asia. A missionary strategist started working with three small house churches in 1993. Just seven years later, in 2000, just seven years later, membership had swollen to more than, get this now, 90,000 baptized believers meeting in 920 house churches. Three house churches to 920 house churches, 90,000 baptized believers in just seven years. How? How? Because they met in these smaller disciple-making communities that focused on making disciples and planting churches. Second story, this one comes from uh, a Latin American country in the early 90s. This one overcame relentless persecution and great difficulty to grow from, watch this now, 250, excuse me, 235 churches to more than 4,000 house churches with more than 30,000 converts. From 235 to 4,000, that's incredible in just a short period of time. Let me give you one more. A missionary strategist, uh, th- this one is a uh, missionary strategist assigned to a North Indian people group found that just 28 churches were there in 1989, 28 churches. There were, uh, these were their house churches. But by the year 2000, just 11 years later, a church planning movement had erupted, catapulting that number of house churches from just 28 to more than 4,500 house churches with, get this, an estimated 300,000 baptized believers. 11 years, 300,000 baptized believers. Now, can you imagine if three or 28 or just a few of our house churches, our small groups at Clear Creek, in just 11 years had that many people? What? Be mind-blowing. See, the focus from Jesus the early church and churches around the world. It's only in America that we think we've got to have these big buildings to have a big impact on the next generation. But Jesus knew, the early church knew, and even Christians right now around the world know that it is in the home, in these smaller disciple-making communities that disciples are built and churches are planted. So so what, what do we do with all this? What do we think? I, I just want to confess, I think I've been part of the problem because I focus so much of my effort and energy on what we're doing right now that I don't spend nearly enough time on making disciples. And maybe you're feeling the same way because the fact is when all of our energy and attention and volunteering hours are spent on things that just keep the engine going with groups or, or, or classes rather at church and Sunday morning worship and Wednesday night, there's no time to make disciples. So I just want to tell you I'm sorry. I apologize, but I'm going to commit to do differently. In fact, I think we've got to flip the script in what we're doing. We've got to flip the priority from what we're doing right now with a big church, big gatherings, to these smaller disciple-making churches, these smaller communities. Now listen, listen, don't worry. Before you stone me, we're still going to have worship. We're still going to do it as well as we know how. I'm still going to preach and yell and fuss at you every Sunday. But we're going to reprioritize our gatherings at home and in our smaller disciple-making communities over this one. And so two challenges, two things I'm going to say. One challenge for us as leaders and one challenge for you. First challenge for us is we're just going to say we're sorry. We're confessing that we have put our priorities in the wrong place by trying to have bigger buildings and bigger programs and all the things everyone asks for, whether it's Bible classes and other things. We recognize that's not getting the job done. If it were, these trends would not be true of the nation and of our church as well. Now listen, we're also going to focus on things that are uh, disciple-centric. So next Sunday... 
during the time that your kids are in their Bible classes, we're going to offer some great things here in the building. We're going to have a prayer room for you to go and pray. You can pray for your kids or the world or our city. There's going to be great stuff there. There's a uh, Kickstarter small group. If you're not in a group and you want to try it, this is your chance to get in one and get started. Uh, we're going to have our growth track, which is about joining the mission of the church. It's going to be great. But next week, we're going to engage you during the 930 time. But we're also going to prioritize our smaller communities over these big things. And so that's where we're going to go. The challenge for you, I'm going to ask you, if you can do nothing else this week, be in a smaller disciple-making community. If you get sick and can't do two things, you can't come to worship and your discipleship, disciple-making community, your small group, I would ask you go to that because that's where discipleship happens. That's where your children will see Jesus being birthed in you more than in this big space. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. Reprioritizing around smaller disciple-making communities that focus on making disciples and planting churches will give you everything that you've always wanted. It'll give you three things. It'll give you a closer relationship with Jesus. I'm just going to tell you, the men that I get with in my small disciple-making community every week, I am more like Jesus because of those men than anything we do here in the corporate get-together. So if you'll do that, you'll grow to love Jesus. Number two, you'll develop good friendships. Don't you want good friends, that people that want to do life the way you're doing life, reaching others, making a difference? You'll find that in these smaller communities. And number three, you will actually make a difference in the world. As we said last week, you can be a part of a disciple-making movement where you personally are a part of planting not one or two, but 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000 smaller churches, these little disciple-making communities. You can make a difference, and I know you want to. And it all starts with a reprioritization to these smaller disciple-making communities. Listen, the trends aren't good. Our kids are leaving. But by following what Jesus said and doing what Jesus did, we might see a revival and awakening in our city and in our state and in our world. And it all begins with you and me making a decision to prioritize things as Christ did. And we've talked a lot about what it means to be a part of a smaller disciple-making community. But I want to end with this. If you do not personally know Jesus, if you have not chosen to be his disciple, today is your day. Because it makes no difference if you're in a group of disciples, if you're not personally a disciple. So if you have yet to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to go out to the next step table in the lobby. It's right there in the back. You go there, someone will help you. Learn what it means to follow Jesus, to be baptized, to turn your life around, to repent, and to receive faith and life in Jesus. If you need prayer, if you just need encouragement, there's a prayer banner out in the lobby, and we'd love to pray over you and just bless you today because you do not have to walk alone. But for all of us here, the trends may be troubling, but there is a way forward as we follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for the way that you're at work in this city. I pray that you will work in our lives. May we prioritize our time in these smaller disciple-making communities so that our lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren will be radically transformed so that when they step into adulthood, they will continue on with you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for loving us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.